Hey there, gang. Are you ready for another fantastic voyage of guitar repair adventure, discovery, and even intrigue? I thought you might be. So this is the patient, or the guinea pig, depending. Uh, this is a Harmony H165, which is an all-mahogany model from the 1960s. And we're going to do so many things to this guitar, it's going to make your head spin. Now we're seriously going to throw the kitchen sink at it this time. There's lots of opportunity for learning, and uh, so it'll probably take about a week to get it done, and if you follow along, maybe we'll have some good times along the way. So everything on the sound box here is made of solid mahogany, top, back, and sides. And so I guess it's sort of like a Martin 15 or 17 style guitar. It's pretty wide. It's 15 inches across the lower bout, so it's akin to an OM or a triple O size Martin. It's got no binding, but they have rounded over the edges with a radius bit, which makes it actually quite comfortable to hold. When you pick it up, it's nice and friendly on the corners. You think about it, this is an entry-level guitar, but the materials involved here, this mahogany, believe it or not, this is a one-piece top. It's a full 15-inch board of mahogany, same on the back. That's something you would not find on a modern guitar. Dating these things can be a bit interesting. Um, this particular model, the 165, was made between 1944 and sometime in the 1970s. It experienced some changes over that period. Um, the body shape went from a rather rounded kind of Gibson-esque thing into this more Martin shape with squared off corners. Other things changed as well, just subtle appointments. I know this one was made after 1958 because that's when they went to this Martin style shape. Dating these can be a little bit tricky depending on whether you can see the serial number and the date code on the inside, usually are on the back and oftentimes they're also on the top underneath the fingerboard extension here. Um, it was very faint in this case. I had to take a picture in raking light and then uh, mess around with the contrast to see what it actually read. And it says F61 made in the USA. In the Harmony dating system you get either an F or an S for first or second followed by the two-digit year. And first and second, that's not referring to the quality of the instrument. It's not first quality and then the factory second. That means first and second part of the year. The Harmony factory would work until the middle of the summertime. The entire place would close down for a week and all the employees got a week-long vacation and then they'd start up again for the second half of the year. So this was made in the first half of the year 1961. So in the vintage American flat top scene, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, Harmonies have kind of an inferiority complex and it's very much left over from that time period when these were seen as definitely a beginner's guitar, an entry-level instrument, something you graduated on. Um, if you got serious, you got rid of this and you got yourself a Martin or a Gibson and no professional player would really want to be seen on stage playing a harmony. Um, they were ubiquitous, like they cranked these things out by the millions, literally. Um, there were a huge number of them, so they're not very rare. But when you think about it, the materials that go into them are actually pretty good, as I was mentioning before. You don't see wood like this in modern instruments at all. But what they really are is an excellent stepping stone uh, for learning repair techniques. You can do it on this one before you go on to work on those high dollar collector's instruments and not have to worry so much. Where Martin was relying on a highly skilled workforce, making fewer guitars a year, doing a lot of hand fitting, Harmony just didn't have that luxury. Uh, they had a different kind of worker um, under a lot of time pressure, so they had to really rely on their tooling and to make that stuff go together super accurately with very little fooling around. They needed to be able to take the neck off the assembly line, pop it into the body. They couldn't spend an hour getting the neck to fit right. So if you want to learn how to do a neck reset, which is one of the things we're going to do here, these are very similar to Martin in that respect. The dimensions are similar, the dovetails tend to fit together very predictably, uh, they're put together with hide glue. These are all very nice things for learning on. It's not always the case with Gibsons. Um, you can find all kinds of weird stuff in the neck pocket of a 1960s Gibson guitar. Other people always ask me about doing this on 1970s Japanese guitars. That's a whole other can of worms. Uh, they can have dowels in the neck joint, and they use a lot of glue, and it can be different kinds of glue that don't come apart nearly as easily. So they can be tricky to work with. And these things here, they're available. You can buy them online for three, four, or five hundred bucks. And if you completely blow it, if you, you know, try to do the neck removal and it doesn't work for you, I mean, the worst comes to worst, you chop it off, you make it into a bolt-on neck. And nobody's going to scream at you in the way they would scream at you if you did that to a 1961 Martin guitar. Nobody wants to see a bolt-on Martin. So what do we want to do on this one? Well, there's a bit of a subculture these days to modify these old harmonies. Uh, take the backs off, rebrace them with X braces, because these are all ladder brace guitars. 
The braces run from side to side up the soundboard here, like rungs on a ladder. And people want to make them into Martins with an X brace because they think the ladder bracing is somehow inferior, less sophisticated. I'm not really in that camp. Um, they do definitely sound different. They're a bit drier, uh, but I don't think they sound bad. Um, they tend to be pretty loud. There's nothing wrong with a ladder brace guitar. Um, not every guitar has to be a D28. The other night I was watching this um, uh, YouTube playlist. I got sucked down a rabbit hole. I was watching these guys. It was a series of young vocalists, and they were doing covers with what was obviously a really great bunch of session players. And I'm watching the guitarist, and every song he's bringing out what's obviously another really funky, low-class pawn shop guitar. Like, really, really, he kind of make you look at him funny. Until you hear it in the context, because these things aren't going to be what you pick up if you're Martin Simpson or if you're doing bluegrass leads. But when you're accompanying someone, they fit really well in a mix. And they really do keep things from sounding boring. Like, every track can be a little bit different. It's a textural thing, you know? It's good to have a few of these things around, just, you know, to make things sound different. So I'm not going to take the back off on this one, tear out all the braces and start fresh. That could be a real pain on something like this that's got no binding. It's got that big radius here. That can be difficult to take off cleanly and put back into place. The ladder brace guitars, they do tend to get some deformation. Oftentimes it's around the sound hole, like it'll warp in a bit of a roller coaster up here. And they also, they're prone to dipping in front of the bridge because there's no support in between each rung of the ladder here. So what I'm going to do is add some sound hole supports on either side of the hole here. And I'm also going to add two little angled braces in front of the tips of the bridge to give it a bit more bounce and try to keep it from sinking in. This one isn't bad. The mahogany tops tend to be a little more stable. The spruce uh, ones from this era, a lot of times they get really caved in in front of the bridge. This guitar really needs a neck reset. The action is very high. I imagine they probably started off from the factory with a setup that was on the high side, and of course over the years it just gets higher and higher. I'm also going to change out this bridge. Some people might like this style of top-loading bridge, but I am not one of them. Um, I don't like the way these interact with the top, and I really do prefer the sound of a pin bridge that anchors the strings through the body. Um, you can see that this one has, or in this case had, bolts, and those are pretty essential with this style of bridge. The forces involved tend to lift them up and pull them right off. Actually, even with the bolts, I've, I've had to re-glue several of these over the years. They will peel up along the back edge here. And as for swapping it out, well, you know, if this was a really pristine example of a rare model Harmony, I would probably just leave it alone and just, you know, try to keep it original. But in this case, I don't feel bad about swapping this out for a bridge I think works better. The frets are not in great shape. They're pretty worn in first position. The other thing is there's excessive relief in the neck. It's about 20 thousandths or half a millimeter at the sixth fret. And there's no adjustable truss rod in this to take that out, just a steel reinforcement. Um, people say, boo, cheap guitar, no truss rod. But you got to remember that Martin made them exactly the same way. Um, they didn't get an adjustable truss rod until 1986. They just relied on a steel bar that ran down the neck. So besides redoing the frets, I can take the opportunity, we'll put this thing on the neck jig and resurface the board. We'll get it good and straight. We'll put on a new nut. Spacing isn't bad on this one. Uh, it's much better than some I've seen, but we'll do a new one just for kicks. And these tuners, these aren't original, which I don't really care about, but they have been installed upside down, which I do. Um, they turn the opposite way you expect them to, so I'm going to replace those. We'll put on a new set of tuners, hopefully ones with some bushings. There's a little piece of the back material that's missing here, and the seam has opened up a little ways so we can do a bit of a patch. I'm even going to put a pickup in this, and we can talk about one of the challenges you face when doing that in a Harmony, because the tail block on these is abnormally large, and the standard jack just won't fit through it. We might put a pick guard on, and lastly, the finish is a little dull and rough looking. We're not going to strip it. I really hate doing that. Um, I don't like losing all of the effects of time and age and the character that's built up, but we will try and freshen it up a little bit. So with all that needs to be done, uh, we have to figure out a plan because some of that work needs to happen before others or else the flow is gone and it makes it more difficult. I don't want to take the bridge off first, for instance, because I want to use this as a reference when setting up the neck angle. So I think the neck reset will be first thing to do. We'll take the neck off. Before I remove the neck, I'm just going to check on the action again, take a measurement of the length of the heel and also the distance between the body joint and the saddle. Uh, the saddle in this case is cut very low, so I'm going to take that into consideration and add a little bit extra so it will protrude higher above the bridge. Uh, 
Here is the formula. I've shown you this before. Don't worry about the increments. This is just an example. It could be metric, it could be imperial. Use whatever you prefer. To gain access to the neck joint, I'll have to remove the 13th fret. So I'm lightly scoring along each side here. That will prevent tear out from moving across into the fingerboard when I come to remove it. I'll also heat it up with a soldering iron. That loosens any glue that's in the slot and just makes them come out more clean. I'm using my modified end nippers to remove the fret. And I got one of these handy dandy devices that goes underneath the crown. It surrounds the tang and prevents the uh, fibers from lifting up ahead of where the fret is coming out. I don't know how to explain that better. But they're pretty good. I've stacked up some feeler gauges equal to the amount I have to remove from the end of the heel and I'll make a light scoring line on there prior to removing the neck so I have something to work to. I got myself one of these little sealing irons for doing fretboard work. Finally retired the great big uh, household iron I've been using for this job for 20 years. I like it, it works pretty good. I want to get to the end of the tenon and not go too much farther because I don't want to peel the board up off the actual neck itself, just the extension. But you do want to get all the way to the end. It helps to work from both sides. Alright, that wasn't too arduous. It took about six or seven minutes to get the whole fingerboard extension loose here. And I can tell by the way the neck is moving relative to the body that the uh, dovetail tendon is probably on the loose side too, which bodes well. Hopefully it won't give us too much of a problem. Crossing our fingers, knock on wood, that's famous last words. Um, no, we want this to come out cleanly. I'm going to use a uh, Stuart McDonald heat stick here, so I have to drill a hole. And um, I like this thing. There are people who swear by steam and don't want to give up on that technology, and that's fine. Whatever works for you. Um, if it comes off cleanly, I, I've got no problem with using steam. Sometimes it's necessary. This thing just, you know, it uses much less water in the process, which I like, uh, especially in guitars that are put together with hide glue. Sometimes you can get the top loosening, depending on where the steam is coming out on the inside. I once had a guy in the comments section comment that I didn't know anything about steam because it was a dry heat. Anyway, so I gotta drill a hole. Um, Harmony um, tenons are usually about, well, they're more than 5 eighths and usually around 3 quarters of an inch long. So you see I've taken out the 13th fret and um, if I want to hit the airspace in front of the tenon, I will take a little bit of an angle. You know, I don't measure it, it's like that, you know. Maybe, whatever's that, maybe 80 degrees. And um, so, when you're using steam, it's really nice to hit that air pocket because you have to, you know, have some way to get the steam at the glue joint. In this case, we're going to be heating up the uh, tenon inside there and the block around it. And um, so it's not as critical, but I still like to do it. I think the air probably conducts the heat as well. And I might put a little bit of water in there too to make a little bit of steam. It's good to have, you know, if we can hit that air pocket, that's great. Um, Actually, to be honest, recently, I'm, I'm rethinking this whole thing because I saw a picture on Instagram by, uh, from Ian Davlin, who I think he's in New Jersey, Lark Street Music. Uh, he posted a picture of something he's been working on. It looks to me like he's using like a nichrome, like a, a nickel chromium wire in stainless steel tubing, and it's quite a small diameter. It's like a sixteenth of an inch, which is nice because the hole you have to drill for this thing is a bit oversized. Depending on the fret wire, sometimes you can see around, you know, where the, you have to patch the hole. Not a big deal to me, but it's it's nice. The thing is, he's got two of them going at the same time. I think he's running it off of like a DC um, power supply, a uh, variable current, like a Variac, a DC um, current uh, supplier. Two at the same time would be great because, you know, you think about it, you really have to, if you have this in one spot, you have to heat up the other side of the tenon as well. Sometimes it's advantageous to drill two holes and swap between them. Um, heating up the whole um, neck block at the same time as much as possible, as evenly as possible. Otherwise, you got to get this one really blazing hot on this side for the heat to travel all the way across. 
If you've got two at the same time, that means you can get away with less heat, you get less charring, it's probably faster and cleaner and funner and whatever. And also I'm thinking like, in the picture, like it doesn't give you all the information, so I'm looking at this thing really carefully trying to figure it out. Uh, I think he's running at around 3 amps, and those power supplies usually give you at least 10 amps, so I bet you you could make up a splitter and probably have four probes running at the same time, which would be really handy when you're doing neck resets on Gibson guitars with a long tenon. Those things take forever, They're, they can be a real nightmare. Um, because there's so much mass involved. Steam usually messes up the finish in a terrible way, and it just it takes a forever to get a Gibson tenon off, the big ones. So I bet you you could run four at the same time, and that would be a real game changer. So I'm kind of interested in trying this out. I can't wait for um, things to settle down a bit, and we can start ordering stuff from the U.S. again. And I'm going to get myself um, a power supply and some, some nickel chromium wire. I'm going to give this a shot, because I like the idea. Anyway, so we're going to drill that hole. I'm going to go right in the center this time. And I usually start, I mean, you can either mark the hole. Or you can run the drill backwards to give yourself a little cone to start with. And it feels like I hit the, the air pocket. Be hard to tell sometimes. Back a little bit. Okay, so that'll go down in there. We're going to heat this up with a soldering iron. Okay, we're underway. I've got the heat stick and the soldering iron. This is just a cheapo Chinese iron. It's a 60 watt version. And um, they make them specifically for use on either Solomon or Weller uh, soldering stations. And those are very expensive irons. I just don't like the idea. Um, I wasn't going to buy, you know, $120 soldering iron for this job. It seems kind of abusive to my mind, um, but it's been there for about six or seven minutes now and I can feel the front edge of the um, neck block is getting quite warm and eventually I'll also feel it down here um, along the sides of the heel. When that happens you know you're probably ready to go. And um, this is my super low tech uh, neck removal jig. It's based on something akin to the Stumac version. Um, I should at some point make a better one, but who has time for that? I've got a little piece of padded plywood here uh, so that my screw has something to bear against that isn't the heel cap. That would be bad. And I'll apply a little bit of uh, tension. At a certain point I'll use a little syringe and we'll put a little water in there and get some steam going as well. Is getting loose. Whoop! Oh, there we go. Yeah. All right. Okay. There we got it. One empty neck pocket. One separate neck. I've lost a little bit of the dovetail tenon here. This is a poplar neck, and uh, that's kind of par for the course. Poplar, it looks like maple, it's much softer and more fibrous. And on a dovetail like this, the angle is such that you can sometimes pop off pieces. I'll rebuild that, that's not a big deal. I'm going to have to shim it out anyway when I've uh, finished with the neck reset. Yeah, that's pretty good. Alright, I think we'll call that a day. I'll get this video edited and uploaded, and we'll let this dry out for a little bit. And tomorrow we can resume. We'll uh, work on getting the neck angle correct and start working on the bridge. Sound good? Take care, guys.